Liz Sumner, and this is I Always Wanted To, the podcast that asks, what are you doing or creating or trying now that you have the time? That someday you've been waiting for is here. My guests today are musician, vocal coach, and music educator, Judy Fine and artist and songwriter, Michael Cohen. Michael's been writing songs since he was a teenager. He's written eight musicals for the theater and his music is available on Jamendo and Spotify. Judy was my guest last fall talking about learning to sing and she mentioned that she also teaches students how to write songs even if they don't play an instrument. I thought it would be interesting to invite them both on to talk about songwriting and how to go about it. Welcome Judy and Michael. Hi, Liz. Hi, Hi. Michael. Happy to be here. So let's start with you, Judy. Do you write your own music? I do. I, I, most of my life is focused on teaching and coaching right now, but throughout my life, I have written songs. I made a CD in the 2000s, and that was my um, lifeline when I was a kid. I had a lot of angst-filled songs like The Caged Bird, things like that. (laughs) All my Mm -hmm. um, teenage oppression songs that sort of got me through those years. Um, But now I mostly teach and coach and I help other people. Either they bring songs to me that they've already started writing and I help them fine tune it, or I help them from scratch, everything, theory, lyrics, whatever. And Michael, tell me how you approach songwriting. Where do you start? Well, it's my whole approach has evolved since I've been doing this. I just calculated for 52 years <laughs> since I wrote my first song. So yeah, as a because be- I could vaguely remember being a beginner, and it was just the thought that I could actually create something new was so amazing. You know, it hadn't occurred to me before, but when I tried it, I came up with this totally original chord progression which no one had ever seen before. (laughs) Then I went, okay, I'm going to go crazy. I'm going to go to an A minor. And then just to be nutsy, I'm going to go to an F. And then who knows, who knows if this is going to work, go to a G. And (laughs) I thought like, wow, that's like revolutionary. Because I had no conception of of music other than as a listener. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my whole approach is from just like, wow. I did it. This is a song. Went through a phase of trying to emulate people I really admired at that point. It would be mostly like Joni Mitchell with the problem that I couldn't sing. So I knew no one would ever hear these songs. Uh, It just took me like maybe 10 years of writing songs before I even played them for anyone. Uh, Why? And I knew I could. Because I couldn't sing. I just had oh. a terrible voice. Oh. I know and so it wasn't teacher. until... <laughs> yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah, well, that would have helped. <laughs> just saying I could recommend a vocal coach if you want. <laughs> yeah, but can you fix somebody who really has a terrible voice? You could probably improve them, but you can't, probably can't get them to performing level. Um, Someone who can't stay know. on pitch. I don't know if that's well, true, maybe, go ahead. Maybe you're a genius. Anyway, it wasn't <laughs> until I actually been writing songs for almost 20 years that I, I met some singers who liked my material and Liz being one of them. And Aww. at that point, at that point, I realized that, yes, I could write songs that people like and they can be heard by other people. And so I focused on writing material for the singers, which was some, is something I've been doing all these years is rather than, you know, particularly expressing, you know, what I'm feeling at the moment, I'm thinking, okay, what, A, what does, what do the singers want to talk about? And what would the audience like to hear? Interesting. From from these singers. So that's the, that's not a typical approach for starters. Most people will want to express themselves. And by the time I had someone to sing, I was thinking, okay, we're in a band. We do a lot of funny songs about relationships. People like those. So I'll write a lot of songs about relationships from female point of view, which is what I did for like 20 years. How did that go? I went on too long. 
Did they feel well. like you, I mean, you were really uh, getting in their heads? I thought the reaction was always good. And so that, that was pretty much my approach is, okay, one of our singers likes country songs. I'll write a country song. And uh, occasionally I'd write something kind of personal, but nothing too obscure. I'd like it, the songs to be fairly direct about what, what the subject matter is. I didn't particularly like uh, obscure poetic lyrics that just kind of are mood. I kind of like, this is a song about X. Mm -hmm. Relatable. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Judy? What, how do you approach it and how do you tell your students to approach songwriting? Um, there are two different kind of newbie songwriters, I would say. One is the, it's usually a guy that plays guitar and really loves coming up with guitar licks but doesn't really know necessarily what to do about lyrics. And the other is the person who writes lyrics to get through life, which was me when I was a kid, and doesn't necessarily know the music part. So usually people are coming from one angle or another. And so the person writing lyrics, if they wanna be a better songwriter, they should learn some music theory, even if it's just some basic. And the person playing guitar should learn about a little bit about lyric writing. I mean, so that that's the, starting place for most new students who are interested in songwriting. But I would say that everybody has their own way of starting a song. So if you haven't, you know, you just had a really bad breakup or something and you're writing, you know, poems about it or something and you feel like turning, you know, pulling your guitar out and strumming to it, that's a really common way. At, at some points, you have to find a different way to start to create songs because all your songs begin to sound the same usually. So I tell my students like, okay, so you wrote the song with the guitar. Next time I want you to find a beat, you can go onto YouTube and write, you know, 70 beats per minute drum beats or something. And they'll come up just something to get you out of your normal routine. And you'll have a whole different feel. You'll, you'll create different melody lines and that sort of thing. Um, some people start with a title. That's a much more, um, I don't know, cerebral kind of approach. You start with a title and then you build a song around it. But Michael, whatever you do, go ahead. I'm sorry, Michael wrote a song based on a, a, a title of Haul My Heart to the Love Dump. <laughs> <laughs> See what I'm no, saying? Actually, one of our singers came up with the name. And I said, <laughs> oh, okay. And he sat down and wrote it in like, what, 15 minutes? Yeah, yeah that is one of the ways. To, but it turned out to be a completely different song. She didn't even have well, that line in it. That happens too. <laughs> that totally happens. I think Cheryl Crow, I remember her in an interview saying that she often started with, with titles. And I think my favorite mistake was one of those titles, which is a really great title, I think. We all uh, have our favorite relationship <laughs> mistakes. <laughs> but the point is you want to keep trying different angles if you want your, you, your songs to have variety and to really grow. And one thing about people who play guitar is their songs are limited by their guitar skills. Or if you're creating a melody just singing out loud, your melody is gonna be not just limited, but it's gonna be kind of contained inside what your skill set is. So if you change it up, you can change up a lot. Did I answer your question? Definitely. <laughs> I'm not yeah. sure I remember what the question was. Well, it's just how, yeah. how do you approach it? Well, yeah. Yeah, for me, I was the person, especially when I was younger, who, you know, I didn't have a lot of happy songs in the beginning because when I was happy, I was out doing things. Mm -hmm. And when I was frustrated or upset, I was home writing songs. But when I started using drum beats first, I really like using a drum beat or some kind of rhythmic feel. That made my melody lines more interesting. Whereas before I had started doing that, it was kind of a da 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 You know, like every song was like that. Whereas when you have a cool rhythm, you start mixing the words into the beats, if that makes sense, or pausing and letting a little music happen before you say another word or whatever it is. So I think rhythms are a great way to start. Have you ever experimented with approaching with starting with rhythms? Um, I've tried just about everything. I've, I keep changing what ways to get started, including coming up with lists of titles. Also, I haven't gone and, and, you know, gotten beats, but sometimes I'll go, well, it's time for a tango or it's time to, for a samba. And so I have that in my head. 
Yeah, I've, as far as the starting approach, uh, you know, over all these years, and you know, I've written a lot of songs, it's every single one seems to have an, a, a different approach. Sometimes it's, I'll just come up with a little guitar lick and then try singing over that. Sometimes that'll, some of them will come from just sitting at a piano and just getting pure melody. A lot of times it's, if I hear something that I like, I'll go, can I write something like that? You know, something that sounds like a beatnik song from the 60s. <laughs> you know, I'm not a teacher. I don't know any, I've never even thought about teaching songwriting. There's some advice I would give if people want advice from someone who's had no success, is... <laughs> you got to work on your marketing skills. <laughs> but, but go ahead. Oh, yeah, we're just, we're just great at that. <laughs> the way I look at it is, if you're looking at a song, there are several components. And, okay, obviously there's melody, there's lyrics, there's rhythm. There's chord progressions. There's arrangements. I think rather than just pick up a guitar and trying to, you know, fix on the, the thing that comes to mind first or just work on this idea you have and then you're done and that's the song, is to go back and think about all of those things and how can I make them more interesting? So maybe the melody, you have a melody that's based on whatever you're capable of playing. Maybe you know three chords, and so your melody is gonna be somewhat restrained. Before you go out and say, well, the song is done, just go back to that melody and say, gee, what would happen if instead of just dropping one step, I go up three? And you know, what if there, at some point in the song there was a really high note? And play around with that. Same with the rhythm, you can go, one thing I noticed, especially, coming out of folk music is a lot of people keep the same number of bars in every line. So which is, you know, standard format, but a lot of times there'll be like two bars of nothing after each line. And you can go back and say, well, what if I cut that to one? Or one thing the, you know, I learned from Beatles is, yeah, what if the song was in four, four and, you just throw in two, three, four bars mm -hmm. after after each line, just to throw people off a little bit. It makes it a little more interesting. Same with chords. You can go well. You know, you're using C, C, F, and G, and you go back and go well. You know, what if I instead of doing two bars of F, I do two of F and two of D minor, and okay. it'll pull you emotionally into some other area and it might make you want to change the melody which might make the melody a little more interesting so these are all tricks basically for because i get bored easily and i think yeah well if i'm bored then obviously the listener's bored so i'm not going to write you know a 16 minute bob dylan song <laughs> I, i'm going to cram everything I know, every trick I know into three minutes and see if I can make it work. So that's my answer. I would say a lot of what you just said is sort of what I do with students. So students are really heavy on one, four, five chords. And I apologize to anybody listening who doesn't know exactly what I'm talking about. But I usually, I, I'll just give them a picture of a scale, like on a staff, whatever key they're in. And I'll just show them the triads on top of each note of the scale. And I'll say, just, you know, take this home and just try replacing some of the chords or just adding some of these in a new place, especially if they're having trouble with a bridge. Bridges are hard for people. That seems to be the most common question I get. How do I write a bridge? Take a chord from this scale that you have not used yet and the rest of the song, make it the first chord of the bridge and just see what happens. And a lot happens just from doing that. Like you don't have to spell everything out because we have a natural, you know, creative side. But mm -hmm. you, you can just change, you put one new chord in and all new things sort of yeah. come to mind. Well, a trick I learned uh, in going to bridges is if, let's say you're in the key of G or C, and the last note before the bridge is, is a G, which is in the key of C. Mm -hmm. And what you 
can do is say, okay, I have a G note here. I'm ending on a G. If I stay on that G, what other chord has G in it? Right. So you can go to E flat, which is a trick that, especially in musicals, that's one way to transition into another key without it being jarring. You're just staying on the same note, but all of a sudden the whole tonality changes. And right. It, it gives you kind of like a, a lift in the song. And Judy, and you, you have back is always a trick. You have um, some tools to help beginners learn about theory. Uh, is that right? Yeah, I have something called the chord book. There's a whole bundle. So there are some, there's a lyric writing workbook in it. There is um, the basics of building chords. So it's basically uh, a beginner music theory workbook, but it's geared toward people who want to get to understanding chord progressions quickly. So it's, it's not covering every aspect of theory. It's just covering the things you need to get there. I actually given you, uh, I've made a coupon code for anybody here listening if they want to download it. Thanks. I'll put um, that in the, the show notes so that people can. Awesome. But, so that the tool that you're describing is going to help people who aren't quite understanding what the one, four, five and the, the kinds yeah. of, of the stuff that you exactly. guys are discussing. Right. Exactly. Yeah. If you go through the chord book, you'll understand what I mean by one, four, five. It, it is, there are many people who try to, to write songs without learning music theory. And, and the idea of learning music theory can be really unsexy to some people. But it's a little bit like trying to learn a language without learning the alphabet. It's very difficult. You can, you know, learn to repeat some things maybe, but you're not really going to understand the language. So um, I tried to make it as accessible as possible. And in that, there's also a lyric writing workbook where I choose some lyrics from popular songs. And I just ask the, the person doing the workbook to just bring those songs up on YouTube or something. And just I analyze the lyrics as far as like s song structure goes, verse, pre-chorus, chorus, bridge, hook, whatever. A lot of people are, have an aversion to learning this kind of stuff because they feel like it's going to ruin their art. But those same people tend to write songs without clear sections. And it's very hard to follow those songs and be interested all the way to the end. So you're better off learning the structure and then you can change it and, and be wild and crazy like Michael, <laughs> but, but at least yeah. know where a good starting place is. Yeah, I know. Michael, yeah. you are quite interested in lyrics. That is a, a core component of your songs. Can yeah. you want to say more about that? Talking about lyrics, I guess a lot of my taste in lyrics comes more from musical theater than from folk or pop or, or rock or blues. For some reason, it seems like every other genre sort of lets lets it slip as far as rhyming goes. In other words, at this point, if it vaguely, if the vowels vaguely sound the same, it rhymes. And I'm just a I'm just a fanatic on this. And people in music theater tend to be search for, if not perfect rhymes, but as close as you could possibly get. And clever and, still. Yeah, and in, internal rhymes also, which you don't. Mm -hmm see them the thing with so it's that structure that actually forces you to be creative if you write a, a one verse and it's fairly easy to write a first verse the hard part is matching it mm -hmm. so if you write a first verse and you just come up with three internal rhymes in one line which is you know you it's you know moon june spoon you get those in one line <laughs> It's not, it's it's not hard. <laughs> <laughs> then you go to verse two and trying to duplicate that is where you're really, it's like puzzle. It's like solving a puzzle. You have to go, okay, in this line, I not only have to continue the thought, but I need three to internal rhymes, the fourth one rhyming with the line above and strict rhythm. And sometimes in order to fulfill all those little things, you come up with something you would never come up with in a million years. Sure. Uh, and it can really lead the song in a whole other direction. Do you have an example? So of uh, mine? Sure. Spoon, uh, Moon, no. June. Yeah, that's brilliant. Uh, <laughs> no, because I do that in almost every song. I would say as far, this is, again, this is my personal taste. I think the best songwriter out there right now is Suzanne Werner. I don't know if you know her. She's been coming up with albums for years and years and years, all originals. And she's, you know, she's studied opera. She can play like cocktail piano. But 
the thing about her songs, when after I hear them, I go, each song is distinctly about something. It's not, it's not like a political message necessarily or anything, but the song, the whole song is about something. And I find a lot of, you know, we spent a long time doing open mics and such. So we heard a lot of singer songwriters doing their early, you know, their early material. And it seems like most of them are totally focused on how I am feeling now. You know? <laughs> yes. I'm mad at you, you know, you treated me bad, blah, 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 which could be, is fine. But when I hear a Susan Werner song, um, there's, okay, I'll just think of one, pull one at random. There's a song called Barbed Wire Boys, which is basically about her father's generation, you know, who grew up during the Depression, these, these Midwest guys who just don't show emotions. Hmm. You know, they're tough. And you know, they will never cry and blah, blah, blah. And she's saying, you know, basically it's, it's a saying goodbye to that generation of then they're gone and they won't be back. I mean, that's just one example, but it seems all her songs are really very thoughtful about what, what do I want to say? What's the best way to say it? So I find that inspirational, but again, I, it's just, as far as lyrics go, it's just my, my taste. And Unfortunately, I can't listen to most pop music because as soon as I hear a really bad rhyme, I run for the room <laughs> screaming. Yeah, speaking of bad second verses, I have a lot of young singing students and they, it's less now, but they used to just love the heck out of Taylor Swift. And there was a lot of Taylor Swift in my life. And she has a lot of songs where the first verse is, it, it's just a normal first verse and it's usually a breakup song. I don't know how many boyfriends this woman has had at this point, but, um, but the second verse suddenly has like twice as many words and she has to change up the melody and she's cramming all these words into the same, you know, structure that the first verse fit in. It happens a lot. And I, I started steering students away from Taylor Swift. Unfortunately, there are plenty of others to choose from, but because they would do really well in the first verse, but some of the younger students really struggled with her second verses because uh -huh. I, I can't even really explain it. It's like it, the second verse was an afterthought or something, or I don't know. Yeah, well, I actually, I was heavily influenced by Joni Mitchell. And I even wrote a paper in college about this one song because I really liked what she did. Uh, the song's called Marcy. Uh, it's on her first album. And she, in every verse, she has a red-green comparison. So something's red and something else is green. She carries it through to every verse mm -hmm. and very strict structure. And I really like that. You don't hear that much anymore, except right. in musical theater, which right. again is, is, uh, is a throwback. That's another um, assignment. Sometimes I give songwriting students to do new, new songwriters tend to write everything in sentences, like complete sentences about how they feel is usually what it is. And so I try to get them to think in metaphors or we'll pick an object and they're going to write a song centered around that object. And so just as an example, um, just as an easy example, a telephone, it can be a breakup song because you're sad that your telephone doesn't ring anymore, or it can be a series of events that happen and you kept finding about the next stage because someone called you or whatever, you know, it could be a pair of jeans. It could be a car. It could be anything, just something other than straight up sentences. Nice. About yeah. how I feel or what I see or whatever. Yeah. Well, there, there is a, I mean, you have the opportunity to create like a poetic language. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and not necessarily poetic obscure, but more also the way people actually talk, which is something that musical theater again does very well because you're really getting into someone else's head. Right. And, and the song should be a carryover of how the person actually talks rather than, the songwriters, the way songwriter. I mean, obviously, uh, Oscar Hammerstein did not grow up on a farm in Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> and he's not just a girl who can't say no. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> to get back to melody writing, uh, and thinking of uh, Rodgers and Hammerstein, I found this really interesting. Uh, this is a, for a tip from Richard Rodgers on melody writing. His melodies are very simple, generally. Mm 
But one thing he always did, he's, and I, I, maybe it was in the interview, I can't remember where I read it. But if you write a, okay, again, you're in C and you're writing a melody, go to the piano and play that melody. Yeah, odds are it's going to be on all the white keys. What Rogers did every to almost, I don't know if it was every time, but a, a lot, was to change one of those notes to a sharp or a flat. And which, if you listen to, you know, Some Enchanted Evening or one of those songs and try playing it on the white keys, there's going to be, you know, what's called an accidental, a sharp or flat, which just creates a whole other world of, mu of music. Yeah. So you were talking about that good songs are interesting. What are, what are other qualities or elements that make a good song? I don't think anybody can answer that for everybody else. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's a reason these breakup songs are popular because somebody's in the middle of a breakup and they need to to somehow get that out. And so they listen to a song and they cry and they eat Ben and Jerry's or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the same with, with songwriting. I, I think it's good to point out that if your goal is to be an, an ever more evolving and interesting and changing songwriter, then you want to learn all these different things and try all these different things. But if you're just picking up your guitar and writing songs because it helps you, you know, get through that day or it's just how you like to spend an hour, just, just do it. Like you don't have to follow my rules or, or Michael's rules or whatever. Just, oh, just yes, do it. Do. So it depends. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not married to him. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> right. But there are, there are certain tricks. Well, there, there are certain tools that a beginning songwriter may not even have thought about. Mm -hmm. um, Cause usually like I said, uh, with my first song, people are usually just thrilled that they wrote a song. Yeah. But th I think the most powerful tool that you've got is, is chords. And because it's, there's this absolutely amazing thing that chords can do, which I, I, mean, I guess there are people getting their PhDs in this, but they actually can pull your, your emotions yeah. in different directions. And sometimes hear a song, and for some reason, the chorus just seems to like glow. You don't know why, you don't even realize it's happening, but it's a, a, a trick of chords that the songwriter does that, you know, it, it's not gonna, you don't have to study music for 20 years to do this. You just have to experiment and see what works. Exactly. Um, the best example, or a good example I know is Penny Lane which was always my favorite Beatles song. That chorus, for some reason, just is such a huge emotional lift from the song. Well, you know, it's a happy song all the way through, but for some reason, the chorus is just like happy squared. <laughs> Why? What is he doing chord-wise? And it wasn't until a few years ago that I looked at it and I went, oh, he's changing keys. The chorus is in a different key than the mm -hmm. verse. And... It didn't require music theory. It's just, if you know it's possible to do things. And so that's why I would always recommend, you know, if you've got your three chord song, go back and throw in some minors. You know, find your melody note and find another chord that fits over that note. And I, who knows why, you know, emotionally where, affected by these chords. I mean, think about why a minor key is sad. I mean, there's no logical reason behind it. A lot of what, I was just gonna say, a lot of what happens is that culturally we're learning the rules of our music, our culture's music without knowing it just because we're alive and we have ears. And so we start to associate things. So I don't know if this is hundred percent of the answer, but at least part of it is that we write sad songs with minor keys frequently and so that gets ingrained into our brains from a really young age that minor is somehow sad if we were in a culture where happy songs were written in major keys it, it could be a very different thing or you know atonal music or yeah. or microtonal music or whatever it is all these things would be normal and and it's kind of like the way we have normal preconceptions about you know anything as humans 
Yeah. Well, I wonder about that. I mean, I don't know. Is it hardwired into the brain or is it purely cultural? I don't know. I, I've heard an argument that because of because we're dealing with frequencies, that the way the frequencies interact with each other and with us, I don't know if this was a scientific evaluation or if this was just this person's feeling, but he felt that the vibrations had an impact on how they, you know, on how we perceive them because they're hitting us. Yeah. I don't yeah. know if that's true. But it, it is somewhat cultural too because, because I, I, what we would consider like one of the prettiest chords is a major seventh chord. <sighs> If you're writing a song, you know, you're lying in the sun and it's breezy, you throw in those major seventh chords. That was considered an awful dissonance. Right. In the 1800s. Uh, right. It was for forbidden to use that chord. Lots of stuff was um, forbidden in the 1800s. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's just another one we're going to throw away. <laughs> yeah. Judy, tell me a couple of songwriters that, that you admire or that you're listening to these days. I was always really drawn to lyrics and sort of creative, kind of what, what Michael was saying, creative, like really making a good point and rhyming well. <laughs> I would say, as, as for when I was younger, I really loved people like, they're pretty mainstream, like Billy Joel, I thought was a really good lyricist. Don Henley, I thought was a good lyricist, even though those were sort of very mainstream people. Nowadays, I'm more about feeling and groove and that sort of thing, and less about, it's probably just because I'm not doing the young angst thing anymore. I don't know. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I really so like- the market for old angst. You can do <laughs> <laughs> I'm too tired for angst now. I just want to chill. <laughs> um, I really like Supreme Beings of Leisure. I don't know if you've heard of them, but it's just a groovy, sexy- kind of retro feeling you should check them out and i just like having it in the background when i'm doing stuff in my house or going for a bike ride and so i'm kind of more into feeling groove now and i used to be very lyric centered oh uh, any other favorites that you want to mention michael you've mentioned a couple influences or favorites either definitely as far as influences goes it would be sondheim as a lyricist mm -hmm. stephen sondheim as far as just music in general, I tend to gravitate a lot towards Brazilian music. And so my favorite performer right now is this uh, Brazilian singer named Roberta Sa. I don't think she writes her own material, maybe she does. But anyway, it's, it's definitely got that Brazilian feel to it. Definitely Beatles, still a big influence. I can name any contemporary artists I really, really like, but I do like uh, They Might Be Giants, which has gone back 20 years, but not lyrically. I think a lot of musicians think that weird and funny is enough. And They Might Be Giants are certainly weird. And <laughs> writing songs about just about anything. I get tired of that because you never know what's actually in their head. It's just all goofy. So, I mean, there's definitely songs that, that stand out, but I have not kept up with, with pop music. I'm curious, Michael, how you feel about Tom Waits' lyrics. I love Tom Waits. I thought so. Uh, the thing is, I never wrote very much like that because he was seriously hip, and I wasn't. <laughs> Again, with the marketing, so, okay. <laughs> no, I mean, he, he basically created a character. Yeah. Which I think he probably lived, you know, just the, right. the low-life L.A. bar scene. And, yeah, I could maybe write one or two songs in that style, but I don't know anything about it. Right, you have to become an alcoholic and <laughs> yeah, maybe, now, maybe live on the street for a few years or something. <laughs> yeah, so that was a real problem in my career. I didn't drink <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask Michael about a songwriting group that I know you had 20 years ago or so. Do you want to describe that group? Because I know a bunch of your best songs came out of that group you were in in Bellingham. Well, well it was actually 40 years ago. Oh. Uh, no, that was the period when I, just coming out of the period where I was writing songs, but never played them for anyone. 
And I had a, I was in a band called the Writhing Rhythm Matzo Balls of Jive. Um, that was my first band where I actually got on stage and played guitar. And the, the three of us decided, since we were just all starting to write songs, uh, that we'd get together once a week. And what we did was see, we had an assignment. We, we agreed on an assignment. And then the next week, everyone would come in and play their song, and then we'd critique it. So that was really the first time I sang any of my songs. But it, these needed to be new songs. So you wrote that song in the week. So really, the first song I ever wrote, which I felt was good enough to be heard, came out of that group. And, uh, and that was because... The first assignment, we just came up with a title. I think it was called The uh, End of the Road or something. And we all wrote a song called End of the Road and played it. And the next assignment was, OK, write a song about New Orleans. We all wrote songs about New Orleans. That's a great idea. It was, it was three of us. And uh, obviously, all the songs were vastly different. Yeah. But after a few of these, I went, OK, we're writing genre songs here. Then my, I picked the assignment, let's write something personal. Hmm. And I came up with, the song I came up with that week was the first time I thought I wrote a successful song. Hmm. And it turned out to be something that, you know, when, when I met Liz and we had Bobby in this group and Glenn, that was, we recorded that and that we, we played that song the whole time we were together. Eye of the Hurricane? Yeah, yeah. So I think that was the first good song I ever wrote, and it came out of this songwriting group. So I, yeah, as far as uh, you know, beginning songwriters, I think that's a good approach. Get together with some friends and yeah, that's a great idea. Do it. I did want to mention one other thing, if I could, please. About for people who don't necessarily um, like have instrument skills, but maybe want to just challenge themselves with writing, you know, and you don't have a band or whatever. Um, the, I did two YouTube videos recently for my channel using beats. There are, are companies all, all over the internet that write beats. This is more of a hop, hip hop feel. Usually I did a, a couple of piano beats. I could actually, I could show you the recordings at some point if you want. Please. Um, but for each of these videos, I, one, I purchased a beat and I just used it the way it was. And I think that was the piano one. I actually can't remember now, but I, was doing this quick video in a couple of days to show people that you can, you know, download this beat. I leased it for, I think one was $17 and one was $21. Um, you can buy it and then nobody else can use it. That's several hundred dollars, or you can lease it for something cheaper and then just know that other people might also use it. You can add whatever you want to it. I just took the beat and I wrote lyrics to it. I recorded basically a scratch track, a vocal scratch track, and I put it up on the video just to show people that there there are avenues to take even if like I don't recommend never learning theory or never learning an instrument but you could start to challenge yourself already with this sort of thing the second beat I actually cut and like I extended I made a double course in the beginning and I shortened the outro and stuff like that that you could also buy beats that where you can get them on separate tracks you can get so I just had like an mp3 basically but you can get the different instrument tracks so you can change out an individual track or you can make it start later in the song or whatever there's all these different things you can do if you don't have a recording studio in a band and, a, and you're not a great instrumentalist the website I use for that is called SFR Beats but there are tons so you can just google it I will put that just want to throw that out there yeah and it's also our taste in music is a little old-fashioned at this point so uh, it's <laughs> it's useful to have something that, that, that people... What are these want. beats she's talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so, I had beats for dinner last night. <laughs> exactly. Get off my <laughs> lawn! <laughs> All right, I'm just talking to you young people out there. Yeah. Ne never mind you, my co-hosts. <laughs> and all you hipsters out there, if if you don't play an instrument and you don't have any talent for playing an instrument, play the ukulele. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you were going to say the radio, but okay. <laughs> no. 
so Judy, do you have a favorite one of your songs that I can add to the end of this podcast? I can give you each of those recordings for those two videos I did for my YouTube channel. If you want to add something, it could show people what the background beat is like. And I just added my voice. It's not like a, a polished, produced song. I did a scratch track and threw some reverb on it. <laughs> I uh, definitely, I would love that, but I also, do you have a, a song of yours that you'd care to share? One of my old cuts, you mean? Yeah. yeah. If, if you don't want to, that, that's I can send fine. you something. Good. I can send you something. Yeah. I, I would love to add it to, to the end of this podcast, and I also would like to add one of yours, too, Michael. What would you like to add to the end? Oh, I, li I think Seed of Your Crime, hmm. that that's version good. we recorded. The one that we did in the studio, studio. in New Hampshire? Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. That would be fun. Uh, when you were talking about switching up the rhythms and changing something around so that it's not just da 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 So I, I am a beginner songwriter. I, I have written a couple, uh, one of which is called Firm Thighs, which started out as kind of a da 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 But we took it into the studio and just messed around with it. And because it wasn't working the way it was. And we just had our band at the time was called Lip Service. And, and we just messed around with the, with the rhythm. And finally, Michael came up with this Bo Diddley thing that just made the songs. Nice. It, it came together in that moment. And I think we all knew it. Is that your recollection of how it happened, Michael? Yeah, we tried it. Yeah, I think he brought it in. It was like an Elizabethan ballad or something. <laughs> I can't even remember. <laughs> and then we tried, oh, let's see if this works as a country song. And we were about to give up. And I went, well, how about if we did that, 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 that. And yeah. then that sort of made it happen. <laughs> it really that's, a really important, um, that's a really important message because newer songwriters get, I don't know if it's like a, maybe a little bit of an insecurity thing, but they get kind of protective of what they've done. And they don't they're not good with critique sometimes, but they also just don't want to change it. And it's kind of like Michael was saying with trying new chords, you have to be willing to change words. You have to be willing to change timing. You have to be willing to try different things to make it, to make it be itself, <laughs> be mm -hmm. what it really wants to be. Mm -hmm. You can't be overprotective of it. I have trouble believing that anybody's like most people's first drafts are good final drafts just because that's usually not the case, but maybe there have definitely been times where I've just been really inspired and an amazing song or amazing to me song comes out of me in like 20 minutes and I don't really mess with it much. But most of the time, yeah. of course, I'm, an, I'm one of those people and like all oh, you probably are too. It never really feels finished. Like there's a, everything I do, there's something I, I have to stop myself from thinking about what I could have done better. Yeah. Well, I have a few 10 minute songs which haven't changed, but I've also got like three, four month songs. <laughs> that exactly. They don't feel finished yet. So <laughs> it's true. Totally depends on the song. I'm really grateful you're, this has gone in directions that I'm really delighted with. So I, awesome. I thank you. Anything you'd like to say in conclusion? Judy. I think I pretty much just said it. Don't be afraid to try different things. Don't be afraid to change up what you got. Don't feel like any song you just wrote is the last song you're ever going to write mm -hmm. or the last great piece of uh, inspiration you're ever going to have and just keep trying new things. Excellent. Michael, anything in conclusion? Yep, totally agree with that. I just think as long as you're being creative in your life, it's, it's worthwhile. So yeah, just do it. And that's the only way you're gonna find out if you're, you're gonna be good at it. Just do it, get it done, get it out there. Great, Great advice. Thank you. I'd like to thank my guests, Judy Fine and Michael Cohen. You'll find links to their contact information in the show notes. And I invite everyone to tell me what you've always wanted to try and how you're making the most of this found time. Also, please take a moment to fill out a brief survey so I can find out more about you. You'll find it at lizsumner.com survey. I'm Liz Sumner, Remind you to be bold, stay safe, and thanks for listening. Stay tuned for excerpts from songs by Judy Fine, Michael Cohen, and Liz Sumner. I'm out of my head. It's out of my hands. You're out of my life, but not my heart. I did what I could with all that I had. I tried. 
it straight for challenging times Oh, I fear In your darkest hour, look me up I'll be right here That's when I pray that we can be friends. I was too innocent and too unwary when first I came under your spell. Lost for years in your dark sanctuary Sometimes heaven, sometimes hell I never thought that I'd return here Like a pilgrim to a shrine Light the candles, let them burn here At the scene of your crime I'm in Accomplishments and high IQ <laughs> are not the traits that people choose. <laughs> so shallow, vain, and half as bright. As long as there's no cellulite, they'll always get the guys. With long, luscious French cut, non-jiggling short shorts, strong.